Hello, everyone. My name is Jen Nolan, and on behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on the topic of what can you do about neck pain? I'd like to begin, however, by acknowledging the tr traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Tonight's webinar is the second in our 2023 series. The topic, the final to be, topic to be covered on Tuesday, the 21st of November, will be an update on the use of medicinal cannabis for musculoskeletal conditions. However, we will also be running our 2023 Coadlo Community Lecture on the evening of Tuesday, the 31st of October. Mr. Liam Mannix, a multi-award winning national science reporter for The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, will be talking about his recently published and highly praised book, Back Up, Why Back Pain Treatments Aren't Working in the New Science Offering Hope. We will automatically register all our webinar registrants for this free online lecture. And if you're not already aware, Tuesday the 31st of October is Rattle Your Bones Day. Rattle Your Bones Day is a national day of awareness for all muscle, bone and joint conditions. It commenced in 2021 following Musculoskeletal Australia's first national musculoskeletal consumer survey, where people indicated that the invisibility of many muscle, bone and joint conditions made living with their conditions even harder. On Rattle Your Bones Day, Australia, Musculoskeletal Australia's second national consumer survey will be launched. So watch out for this and make sure you and anyone else you know who has a muscle, bone and joint condition completes the survey. Our presenter for this evening is Sean O'Leary. Sean is an Associate Professor in Physiotherapy between the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Queensland and the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital Physiotherapy Department. He is also a specialist musculoskeletal physiotherapist and fellow of the Australian College of Physiotherapists. Sean is across clinical education, all levels of physiotherapy training. He has had a research focus on the prevention and management of neck pain over the past 20 years and has co-authored over 100 research articles and two books concerning the management of neck pain. We're extremely grateful to Sean for presenting this evening's webinar. And without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to him. Thanks very much, Sean. Thanks, Jen. And thank you very much to Musculoskeletal Australia for asking me to, to present this tonight. Um, so tonight I want to talk about, well, what can we do about neck pain? And um, hopefully for people who manage neck pain or some people who have, who are viewing who have neck pain hopefully will give some insights into some things that can be can be very helpful particularly uh, the focus of tonight of course is going to be around um, conservative uh, treatment so non-surgical management of neck pain which is what I do as a, a specialist musculoskeletal physio and so um, I'm uh, for the last oh geez 25 years now something I've combined um uh, practice with and research and teaching predominantly around neck pain and so I want to talk about some of my experiences in that um, tonight getting oh here we go uh, just in terms of disclosures I just have to uh, say that I've um, been very lucky to be able to have co-authored um, two books on the management of neck pain with my long-standing colleagues Professor Joel and Professor Feller, um, Associate Professor Trelevin and Professor um, Sterling, uh, and I received royalties. It's really not very much, but I received some royalties uh, from those two books. So what do I want to do tonight? Well, I want to put it all under the umbrella of well, what can we do about neck pain? And first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the problem of neck pain. And then to talk a little bit about what we know about neck pain and what the neck does in function, because that can then start to help us to devise ways of rehabilitating necks or improving neck function that can help alleviate people's neck pain. And then think some specific practical things around what we might do for neck pain. 
if we first of all consider the problem of neck pain, well, you know, together with low back pain, neck pain is one of the the leading causes of disability worldwide, as um, you know, determined there by the World Health Organization. And what we know about neck pain is that most people will get an episode of neck pain sometime in their life, and you know, for most of the time, that neck pain will will go away pretty quickly. Might take days, some people weeks. But probably the bigger problem is that we know a lot of that neck pain will often represent. And so people can get these recurring episodes of neck pain. And that can then become problematic because it, you know, sometimes those episodes will become closer together. And then sometimes people will feel like they, they have neck pain all the time. And so it's very much a hallmark of neck pain that it can be recurrent or episodic. And that knowledge has really uh, helped inform, though, a lot of the ways that we try to, to um, manage neck pain in that when you're looking at someone who has neck pain, you know, you're trying to help them alleviate that current episode that they have, but really should also be thinking about preventing further episodes. And, you know, we think one of the insights into doing that or avenues to doing that is you know around really good sort of lifestyle modifications with some things but also around ensuring that people adequately rehabilitate you know their neck muscles and their neck function i always think it's it's insightful about what you might do for your neck pain by sort of thinking well what does the neck actually do you know in life um, and we've got a couple of pictures here, and I've I've already talked about you know office workers who will sit in a sustained period uh, position for a long time during the day. Um, you know, often they'll be on a screen, or they might be on a split screen where you know they'll have their neck in a sustained turn position for quite but to look at some yeah you know, the other screen with, and all of these things can can um, irritate someone's neck, and so. You know, for those sorts of people, we, we might be trying to get them into a better position. Uh, but even more importantly, we might be giving a lot of advice and education to get up more often and move out of that position just to give the, their neck and, uh, a little bit of a break. The other picture up here shows a very common situation of people, you know, either reading a book or very commonly um, working on their laptop computer with their neck in a slightly bent position. Now, the, the neck's meant to be able to do that. It's strong enough to do it. But if you hold it there for a long time, then, you know, that can cause you, your neck to be a little bit under strain. And if you do that for hour after hour, of course, you know, that can that can lead to some strain in the neck. Because what the what the key function of the neck is, is that it holds the head up. And the head, you know, depending on how big you are, the head can weigh four to six kilograms. And so that's quite a heavy load on top of, of your neck. And so when you are doing some activities like that, where, you've, where you're holding a little bit of a bent forward position, that gravity lever arm increases when you're doing that so you know for people like that who get neck pain when they're doing those sorts of activities the the obvious thing is to either try to have the book up a bit higher or put their laptop on, on something so they don't have to put their neck in that bent position or just get out of that position more often and take more regular breaks don't stay there for so long so there's some very common sense things that you know you can do depending on what causes your neck pain the other thing the neck does, because it holds the head up, the head contains the sensory systems of the body. And so, you know, your vision, your vestibular system, so the inner ear, you know, you know, your hearing and everything. And so the neck very finely controls the head on neck, the, the, the head position to serve the sensory system. Because as you know, if you, if you hear something, the first thing you do is you turn your neck to get your head so you can see where the noise came from and so on. And so you can imagine... When you're doing fine work and you're doing, you know, you're, um, whether it be typing or whatever it might be, then um, the eyes need to be positioned in the right spot. And so your neck's doing that fine positioning. So it's very important for the sensory systems. But it's also very important in some really strenuous activities and strong activities. And, you know, I've got some pictures here and, you know, um, of a lady throwing a, a, a volleyball or um, handball over it is. And the, a lot of people will get neck pain with activities that involve their upper limb. And that's because 
the shoulder girdle is very strongly attached to the neck via muscles. And so you need a really strong neck to have good upper limb function. And you'll get a lot of people who will get pain with just with lifting activities at work or, you know, chopping food on a board or, you know, driving with their arm resting out for a while. And so, you know, the neck needs to be very strong for shoulder girdle function. But we also have, you know, other day-to-day -day activities. And here we've got this dad, you know, and it's very common sort of thing. Probably some kid will jump on his head at some point in time during this. And so the neck needs to be strong as well to, to you know, for these sort of daily activities. And then people like to do things like pack their heads into rugby scrums, which is, of course, is enormous forces through the neck. Um, and so it's interesting because when you look at the neck, you know, the neck has the greatest mobility of any spinal region. And you can you know, know that on yourself. You look at your neck, you can turn your neck, you know, all the way around both sides and you can move it up and down. And it's got a lot of mobility. But when something's got a lot of mobility, it really needs, it depends a lot on the muscles for its physical support. And we know that the neck is very dependent on, on its muscles for its physical support, particularly in, in holding the head up during function all day. And yeah, around it's estimated around eighty percent of the physical support of the neck comes from the muscles. And the the interesting part about that though is that we know through a lot of research over years, and I've been involved in a lot of this sort of research as well. We know that people who will have neck pain quite often uh, have um, suboptimal muscle function. So they may have a, you know a change in the coordination of their muscles, or their muscles might be weak or lack endurance or or something like that. And so, you know, knowing that dependence and knowing those studies that have shown that neck muscles can be a problem in people with neck pain has really helped us to gear up how we go about treating and managing neck pain. Why have I got pain in my neck? You know, tonight I'm really concentrating on, you know, what we would call mechanical neck pain and, you know, musculoskeletal neck pain and that's pain that's associated with you know strain or inflammation or some arthritic conditions that affect the neck structures the bones the joints the ligaments the muscles and so on can i just say right now though that you know um some some neck presentations though might be you know uh of, of a more serious nature most of the time it's not but some neck presentations particularly those that might be associated with with really severe neck pain of sudden onset or that might be associated with a sudden onset headache that have, doesn't seem to really have any known cause. It's just come on or it might be associated with other neurological type of symptoms or, you know, um, or might be very persistent or unrelenting or very painful at night. There can be some serious underlying causes of neck pain. So if that's the case, it really is, you really do need to go and see your, your, your medical practitioner um, or, or your qualified health professional and get that looked at. Um, but as I said, most of the time, that's not a serious cause. And what tonight we're going to be talking about, you know, pain associated more mechanical musculoskeletal pain. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know anything about neurolymphatic therapy, um, but uh, I'm happy to chat more later. Um, so, Sorry, I was just answering a question that popped up there. So neck pain can be experienced in the neck, obviously, but it can commonly refer to the head. And we'll talk a bit about neck-related headaches. Uh, it can refer to the shoulder, to the arm or the thorax, you know, to the um, middle of the back. So it can be more than just the neck. Some neck pain conditions can involve the nerves. And so you can get some neck pain conditions where there can be you know, swelling or compression around the, the nerves as they exit the brachial plexus and run down the arms. And sometimes that's neck pain that's associated with arm pain, but you can have arm pain without irritation of the nerves. But but often if you have irritation of the nerves, you can get arm pain, you know, pins and needles and numbness um, as well, and sometimes weakness. Now, these are very common presentations as well, and they're often called cervical radiculopathies is the term that often used. And, and for the most part, they can be treated you know, uh, conservatively very, very successfully. Some of those presentations, though, can be quite severe, and particularly if they involve um, loss of nerve function. So, you know, people who present with a lot of weakness or a loss of reflex, 
sometimes they're the sort of neck conditions that might need a surgical opinion um you know uh, but but most often you know they can be treated conservatively but if they're the real severe end they might need surgical uh, consultation as well in some neck pain states the pain and tenderness might be really widespread and so certainly for some people that have had pain for a while they might notice other areas that um you know can get painful and so things can get a little bit sensitized and so it can be very variable the presentation of neck pain are my headaches caused by my neck well look there's lots and lots of different types of headaches and i'll just say now that you know the presentation of a headache really does need to be um, diagnosed and assessed by a qualified health professional is that they can be very tricky to determine the underlying cause there is a type of headache that is caused by the neck though and you know they're called cervicogenic headaches or neck related headaches and the rationale the underlying cause is that the nerves that supply the neck and particularly the upper neck that, that it attaches onto the spinal cord at the same place that some of the nerves from the trigeminal nerve of the head attach onto the spinal cord so when people get pain that's generated from their neck they can also perceive that in the head and that's a neck related headache but it's associated with neck related findings some you know finds of findings of physical impairments of the neck when you examine them now it's a headache cervicogenic headaches are the hallmark of them are a neck pain and headache but other types of headaches will also present with neck pain even in the absence of any um, observable impairments of the neck so a couple of the more common types of primary headaches so you know migraine type headaches of which there's many different types and tension type headaches they can also report neck pain as a feature of their headache because of that connection of the nerves now i bring this up because it's very important when you start thinking about treatment though because it's only cervicogenic headaches that have the strong evidence in the research of actual impairments of of the neck and so it really does need to be looked at by an appropriate health professional and uh, to differentially diagnose what type of headache the person has and people can have mixed headaches so some people have more than one type of headache they might have a you know neck related headache that they get quite frequently but they also might get uh, migraine headaches that they get um you know uh, once every couple of months or so on and the reason this is important is that when you look at the evidence of treatment, if you look at treatment that's directed at the neck, so physical therapies that are directed at the neck in terms of, you know, exercise and maybe some hands-on manual therapies, there's good evidence for the management of cervicogenic headaches with physical therapies of the neck because that's the type of headache that has the musculoskeletal impairments of the neck. There is some have evidence that neck physical therapy might be healthy for some types of tension type headaches but um the the evidence at the moment doesn't suggest that neck physical therapies make a substantive long-term change to migraine headaches they thought that sometimes it might make a, a, some short-term changes but maybe not longer term changes and there's a lot of work to be done there so um it the reason i bring that up is it's very important to know and to have someone help you diagnose what type of headache you got and, and as to whether you um, actually get neck related headaches oh, sorry i think i went past one then yep um what about dizziness and dizziness is another thing that um you know and dizziness is a big umbrella term and under dizziness there's terms such as unsteadiness lightheadedness disjointedness and that's a bit different from vertigo vertigo which is very much a this room the world spinning the room spinning that's commonly associated with a vestibular problem but people you know commonly present with neck pain and will report some dizziness and there is a type of dizziness that's from the neck as well like the headaches so you know cervicogenic dizziness neck related dizziness um, and the way that works is that the, the neck is a very um, rich source of receptors that help the body tell the brain where it is in space and where the head's positioned. And if you have some impairments or an injury of the neck, you get an altered message from those, um, those receptors and, and the symptom that people can feel is dizziness as a result. 
but similar to headache, you know, dizziness can be caused by so many things. And some thing, causes of dizziness can be quite serious, can be, you know, involved with vascular problems or, you know, in, and vestibular disorders that really do need a different type of treatment and, and medical attention sometimes. And so when you do have dizziness associated with your headache, again, it needs to be diagnosed or, or assessed by a suitably qualified health professional. Because when you look at the treatment of dizziness, it, it's only really neck-related dizziness, you know, that will that will benefit from therapies that are directed uh, at the neck, and it might it won't benefit other types of dizziness. So it's important to differentiate that. I want to talk just a bit about now managing neck pain, and look, I put up some terms there that are relevant for any treatment of any musculoskeletal condition, but certainly relevant for neck pain. You know, the first is patient-centred and the need for, you know, management planning to be a collaborative process between the therapist and the patient so that all the important things, the things that are important to the patient are taken into consideration, um, you know, and they're part of the planning, which leads to a much more, you know, successful sort of outcome for people. Matched care. You know, there's no one-size-fits-all with the treatment of neck pain, just like there isn't with anything else either. You know, we really do make an effort to try to, as best we can, match interventions uh, to to what we see to be a, a problematic feature of the person's neck pain. Multimodal. What I mean by multimodal is that, you know, there's much better success of treating neck pain when, you know, different things are combined um, and, and it's not just one thing by itself. For, for example... You know, if we look at neck pain, commonly a nice combination of things is, you know, very individualized patient specific advice and education about them. We'll talk more about that in a minute about things they can do for their neck combined with appropriately prescribed and progressed exercise to really get those muscles working that we know are so important in, in necks. And as a, if appropriate in a patient, combine them with some hands on gentle hands on therapies is quite often a nice combination a multimodal combination multidisciplinary you know you'll have some patients who really will need a multidisciplinary approach you know they might be seeing the physiotherapist who might be working on exercise and lifestyle factors and so on or hands on but they may also need you know some advice from from an occupational therapist around their ergonomic setup at their desk or they might need they might be on several medications and needs a pharmacist's input or you know, they, they might be suffering from a lot of stress and anxiety or, you know, or depression or that might be um, interfering with their ability to get recovery and they might need some involvement from a psychologist. So some people's disorders might need a multidisciplinary approach. I've put prevention there, and this gets back to that recurrent nature of neck pain that we talked about in that, you know, we should also always have a, pre a preventative mindset it's not about just alleviating the patient's current episode of neck pain, but also thinking about preventing it from coming back by appropriately rehabilitating someone's function and ability um, to, to withstand the daily stresses of, of, of life on the neck. Yeah. Self-management. You know, the focus should always be on the patient-led self-management because that's much more sustainable and sustainable improvement and, and less of a reliance on some passive therapies that might be helpful in that multimodal approach, but, you know, might not be helpful in the long term. What will be helpful is the patient being able to self-manage. And so there's some really important key things. Yeah, you know, we talk about managing patients and managing and everyone be used to the, the word, you know, in the biopsychosocial approach. And that's because we know that the biological features, the psychological features and the social features of a presentation, um, you know, don't don't work in isolation and very much interrelated. And, you know, trying to work out the relative um, contribution of these and, and where to target treatments is a challenge because it's very different in different patients. And of course, we talk about biological, we, you know, some of the things we might be talking about are some of the, the pathoanatomical, pathophysiological processes underlying their disorder. For example, how they might present, what imp physical impairments they might have that might need to be worked on. Of course, the psychological factors, you know, again, it's a huge area, but, you know, some of the things such as patients who might have a high level of, you know, um, stress or anxiety that might be manifesting and magnifying their pain experience or perhaps 
making them hold their muscles really tight or they might be under stressful work situations where they're trying to meet deadlines and they're just working and not taking regular work breaks enough and you know and then there's things like depression and things that might impact on someone's ability to to be um participate in rehabilitation or so there's so many things that might you know the, the psychological side can, can uh, um, play out social features as well you know we're very used to talking about the social determinants of health and there could be so many things you know the example i would give in in neck pain that is been observed in several studies in in the work situation is that when you look at people who have neck pain or go on to have neck pain that relationship between your know, work related stress and going on to have neck pain is very much dampened and moderated when the person works in a very supportive work environment when they have the support of their colleagues and their work team, you know, that impact and, and the, that prevalence of neck pain is less. And so a lot of social things as well. And so trying to determine how this all fits together into um, different patient presentations is important, and, but it can be quite challenging. Look, one of the things in terms of, you know, for, as, a, as a therapist managing neck pain, but um, but also, you know, from some of your perspectives, if you have neck pain yourself, I, I reckon one of the, the, the key things to really being able to take control of neck pain is understanding the factors affecting an individual's neck pain and how that neck pain affects the individual's life. And this happens often in the patient interview. When, you know, well, it does mostly happens in the patient interview where you really take the time to question the patient about, well, what what really aggravates your neck? What what do you have trouble doing? Tell me, describe it, demonstrate it to me. I want to understand it. You know, what underlies it? You know, is it something that you, you lack mobility in your neck to do or do you have plenty of movement? You just don't have the muscular capacity to hold it there. Is it something that you find fearful with your neck or is it something that, you know, um, that where there needs to be some modification of equipment or does it need to be something where you need to change your work behaviours, where you maybe take more regular work breaks and things like that. You know, going into depth with that with the patient and problem solving with the patient can give so much insight for both the therapist and the patient as to how they can get on top of this and things they might need to modify. It really does, from a therapist's perspective, it permits individualized advice and education and you see this and i often um mark exams and biovers and things and i and when you see a, a a health professional do this well with a patient they can give really individualized advice and the patient feels informed because they're part of the the decision making problem solving process um you know it empowers the patient to self-manage because a, a lot of these problematic activities that can sometimes they can be very simply modified and you know, sometimes there's a commonality of position or movement or something acti in these activities that can really be very simply impacted that can make a big impact on, on the person's pain. It also, from a treatment perspective, helps to facilitate, you know, very meaningful goal setting between the therapist and the patient. So spending the time doing this to really understand, you know, the patient's condition and how it impacts their life um, uh, I think it's such a vital thing to, to set up a very individualized management approach. Now I've put this up here. Does my posture affect my neck pain? People have talked about this for a long, long time, and we've done some work on this as well. And, you know, it's interesting. A lot, a lot of the studies when they look at posture, will look at someone just in an upright standing position and they'll take a photo of them or an, or an image and they'll look at the angles of the neck and head and, They'll try to correlate it back to the person's pain or their level of pain. And, and those studies have shown some pretty inconsistent findings. I mean, some studies show in some relationships, some studies show in un, un, unrelated. Shape. What seems to be more important is what yeah, we've termed functional postures, is what the person does over a sustained period, you know, during their work or activities. This seems to be the most important factor. And certainly we have done some studies where you know, we've looked at people in neck pain doing, say, a typing task for a while, and they tend to creep their head into more of a forward posture, which might, you know, put their neck in a position that could be irritating to to, to a sore neck. Um, I have a PhD student who looked at office workers and, and looked at office workers who had no neck pain, took a few tests, them, and one of them was looked at their posture while they did an hour of work on a computer. 
and and he found that the ones that spent more time in a, in, a, in more of a slouched posture were um, tended to be the ones that went on to develop neck pain over the next 12 months. So there is a lot of work to do around how relevant postures and are for you know different presentations of neck pain. But certainly, you know, when we talk about posture, it does seem to be these functional postures during work, the sustained activities that seem to be the most important thing to consider. Will exercise help my neck pain? Well, look, I've talked a bit about, you know, neck muscle function and 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 impairments that we found in the neck muscles of people with, with neck pain. And, you know, and certainly when we look at clinical trials and, and put it all together in systematic reviews, it shows that exercise is effective in relieving neck pain. Um, you know, various, but it shows, it's shown that various exercise programs have shown good effect. You know, it's not just one type of exercise program. And in particular, exercise programs um, that have focused on movement control and muscle coordination have shown some good effects, as well as exercise that have, you know, really worked on trying to improve the strength and endurance of neck muscles. And some of these exercise programs have directly exercised the muscles of the neck, at the front and the back and the sides of the neck. And some of them have used upper limb um, exercises and so on. And you know, with some good effects of exercise, I think what what really you know is probably good advice again is is to have someone a qualified health professional actually have a look at the you know the physical function of your neck, and and work out a, an exercise program that's structured for your capabilities and that's adequately progressed, because sometimes if people start with too hard an exercise program that their neck can't cope with, that's when they might get a bit of an irritation of their neck. But so certainly you want to start at the right level within your capabilities and some and having that supervised by uh, adequately trained health professional can be really helpful, but it does need to be progressed because the necks need to be strong as well. You know, we did a, it's interesting, you know, based on what I'd listened to a lot of patients over time, that you know, uh, tell me that their neck pain, sometimes a common story in some patients with neck pain was that, you know, their neck pain seemed to coincide um, with them stopping regular exercise, you know, I'm talking about general exercise for for fitness and sport. Um, you know, sometimes that might, you know, they might start working a lot more, or maybe it was they they suddenly they've suddenly had children and so they didn't have as much time and so they stopped going to the gym or they stopped playing touch football or stopped doing aerobics or whatever it might have been that they did, and that sort of seemed to be a common thing that some people. Said and so I had one of my honours students, um, Josh Island, look at you know was there any evidence around um, that regular participation in exercise that was intended for fitness or sport might have some protective effect? And so there was some it look it was pretty weak evidence, but there was some evidence in the literature that you know regular exercise you know uh, exercise um, for fitness and sport also may be helpful. So in the long term management of people, it's one of those things you, you might do some specific rehabilitation around the neck and neck muscle function to make them stronger, but then getting them back to things that they used to enjoy that perhaps that were helpful to preventing, you know, neck pain might be a key thing that they do that, that, that they're more likely to sustain too and, and continue on. Will hands-on therapies help my neck pain? Look, there's lots of different hands-on therapies, you know, massage and um, lots of things uh, when I'm talking talking about here mostly are, are, are treatments around joint mobilization and you know there can be manipulation with associated with a cracking noise sometimes but predominantly joint mobilization when you look at the neck there is evidence that indicates that manual therapy can be effective in reducing neck pain and as i said before quite commonly it has a better effect when it's combined with other modalities you know such as exercise or an advice and education the thing is it really does have to be applied the appropriate people and not all people will benefit and some people may be contraindicated for one reason or the other to having manual therapy so again it, you know it should be a joint decision making process with between the therapist and the patient as to whether hands-on treatment uh, will be helpful and, and certainly for it to be continued it needs to be helpful just to sort of end to say look that i've talked mostly around the things that they're you know um you know, the physical therapies of the neck, you know, advice, education, hand-on treatment, um, exercise. 
there are other interventions that some people will find very helpful for their neck pain. I mean, the ergonomic interventions, modifications that we talk about, if you, know, you think your workstation at home or at work, you know, work is a, a problem and putting you in positions that, that um, are strenuous for your neck, they can be helpful. You know, stress reducing strategies, um, you know, simple things like abdominal breathing and imagery and, you know, um, can be thing, helpful things to reduce um, stress. And um, I, my colleague, Professor Michelle Sterling, is doing some work in this, particularly with regards to whiplash, finding some good effects um, of, of stress relieving exercise approaches um, in conjunction with other, you know, exercise, other exercise types. Acupuncture, some people will find very helpful, you know, um, for alleviation of neck pain. The use of heat or cold, you know, some people don't like cold packs on their neck, um, but certainly, um, you know, heat might be a nice helpful thing that people can just uh, uh, alleviate some neck pain to help them function. Other things like, you know, TENS, so transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, which has been around for a long time. Yeah, for those that are maybe in severe pain that might finding other things um, not helpful, that can maybe give them some, some pain relief. So certainly, there, this is not an exhaustive list, and I just put these things up to say, look, there are other things that may help, um, you know, in addition to the things I've talked about. What about whiplash injuries from a car crash? And so, you know, for those people that might, their neck pain might have started after a motor vehicle accident, they sustained a whiplash. Um, I'm not going to talk about that much tonight. Just to say that, you know, for the majority of those people, they recover quite well. But there is, you know, and there's no real reason to treat them any differently to any other neck pain for the majority of people after a whiplash. But there is a, a, a proportion of people after a whiplash injury who um who will go on to have some persistent pain and disability. And um, my good colleague, Professor Michelle Sterling and her team and in conjunction with the team from Sydney, um, you know, have done a lot of work in, in this area of whiplash and some of the causes that, um, you know, uh, so, some of the underlying problems that people can have after a whiplash. And I urge you to go and have a look at their website, uh, My Whiplash Navigator, which I've got the web address there, and you'll find enormous amounts of helpful information uh, for those that are, are managing patients with whiplash or, or have a whiplash themselves. And so... Um, Thank you very much. That's all I wanted to really say tonight. I'm sorry, I have missed some questions along the way there too. I just thought I'd better. I was looking at the time, Jen, think I'd better finish. I went a bit longer than I thought I was going. No, that was great, Sean, and was and just really interesting. And um, unfortunately, I, I don't have a, any problems with my neck at the moment, but it's certainly one part of our bodies that I think you take for granted until you do have a problem, a, a, you know, neck pain, um, and I can imagine it would be just, you know, a very, very um, difficult and, uh, you know, distracting uh, thing to deal with. So I think the things that you outlined with regards to um, uh, the approach to management and so on was re were really very sort of comprehensive and gave a great overview. Um, now, I'm, I've got a, a couple of questions that I'll put to you, and I would suggest to anyone who'd like to ask a question, if you could type it in the, the chat or the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screens, that would be great. Um, there's actually a question that came in to Sean, someone who couldn't attend today, so I'll actually just read it out if I can. The question was, yep. can, can a congenital cervical spine fusion cause physical pain and other symptoms over time? Or are these pain sensations and other symptoms neuroplasticity? Um, well, that's probably two different two different questions there. Um, look, I, I I don't know if having a congenital fusion of the neck will will always lead to neck pain, um, but you know if you're looking at normal function of the neck and the ability to turn fully if you if you don't have mobility from one joints then the, the argument would be well then the the other joints have to make up for that and so maybe people may be more prone to some uh, you know overuse or strain of their neck if they're you know doing a lot of big movements so certainly um you know that's possible but i don't i don't know any evidence of definite cause and effect with that yeah um, you know the other one about the onset of pain and neuroplasticity. Well, we know that you know, in some situations, the the pain can become persistent, 
and there can be some changes in the central and peripheral nervous system and the way the brain processes pain and it can affect people's pain experience that can be impacted by a lot of things. And there's been a lot of work around, you know, and again, that doesn't happen in all situations, but it can with some people, there's been a lot of work around, you know, the need for people to understand that process and, um, you know, to be educated about it and that can be reassuring for them. And, um, um, and you know, a lot of people are trying to develop therapies to, to, you know, help that, that situation. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks, Sean. Um, now, you talked about the biopsychosocial approach to, to um, you know, the consideration of what might be the issues for a person experiencing neck pain. Uh, there's a question that came through about, do you think the stress in our society brings on neck pain and then becomes permanent, which I suppose very relates, much relates to that social component of the biopsychosocial -psycho model. Would you like to comment on that? Oh, well, look, there's a lot of stress in all of our lives and people with and without neck pain have stress. So it, it's not necessarily that the that if you get stress, you're going to get neck pain. The, the important thing is in, you know, we know that, you know, stress, um, you know, the stress and health um, relationship, it, it can, you know, is there in a lot of different conditions. So stress may play a factor and sometimes a big factor in some people with neck pain, but not all. And they might, some people might have stress, but they may not relate it to have anything to do with their neck disorder. And so that's part of the challenge of working out when, uh, you know, stress or anxiety or whatever it might be, in fact, is playing a part in the person's neck pain and whether that be, you know, magnifying the, the feeling of neck pain or or manifesting in other ways that you know is is have is um reducing their ability to rehabilitate or to recover adequately so yeah. i think it's just so variable between people yes yes and and obviously as you sort of said that initial sort of interview or questioning between the the health professional and and the um the person really is quite critical to really tease out all those issues Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and Sean, you talked about um, cervicogenic headaches. There's a question about um, occipital neuralgia. Oh, yeah. yeah, occipital neuralgia. Well, that's a different, that's a different type of headache, uh, or different type of pain in the head, and that's from irritation of um, of occipital nerves, in, you know, um, in the back of the head, and that that's that's a type of headache that's associated with irritation of those nerves. Uh, so it's not it, it can it can be pain that's in the neck and then up the back of the head and that but it's not it's a different headache to cervicogenic headaches which are um, headaches that emanate from the you know the structures of the neck and the, right. particularly the upper neck. Yeah. yeah, and um, it's interesting. Someone made the comment in the chat about um, that they'd never actually been asked the sort of the detailed questions to tease out what might be causing the neck pain. When does it happen, and so on. So they're just making a comment that uh, they thought those questions were really good, um, not only for a health professional to ask, but actually for them to ask themselves. So they sound they found that. Um, uh, are really worthwhile. Um, now, this is an interesting one. Does the turkey neck give neck pain? The turkey neck. I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure uh, that is. Yeah, I'm not quite sure about that one either. Um, does uh, does the um, uh, neck does neck pain have any relationship with TMJ problems? Yeah, um, and, yes, it can do, and um, you know. Jaw function and neck function are, are quite dependent on each other. And so, um, for example, you know, the common example we give is that, you know, if you sit in an upright, a nice upright position and tap your teeth together and then sit in a very forward head position with your chin poked out and tap your teeth together, you'll notice a different contact of the, the teeth. And that's because, you know, positions of your neck and postures of your, your neck um, have an impact on the, the muscles that control the, the jaw and it, and that can change the the way the your actual jaw moves and contacts and so um, very commonly people will present with neck pain and jaw pain mm -hmm. and you know, um, 
and so sometimes people will need to you know if they will need to work on both or or um yeah so yeah they are they commonly overlapped mm -hmm. and um and sean when when is a scan necessary um is it only when nerve pain radiates down the arm so you yes you didn't really sort of talk about scans are they are they sort of uh recommended um when when sort of diagnosing and working out an approach with neck pain and of course there's an emphasis not to over scan Mm -hmm. there's a big but look sometimes there is a you know it's indicated that uh, i talked about you know patients that present with quite severe arm pain or the presence of marked weakness or loss of reflex or you know particularly if that condition might be deteriorating or it's not improving and you know there's there's they're suspicious there might be some sort of compressive um thing happening to one of the nerves that may be an indication to go on and have a have a you know an mri or something to actually have a look at that um patients that might present after a trauma may you know and so there's a you know patients where they it might have been a trauma where their their head you know was moved quite rapidly or 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 there's been a direct impact of their head or you know might be associated with concussion perhaps but so there's been some trauma to the head and neck and if they you know they there may be indications for those patients to go on and have an image um, just to check that there's been no fractures or anything like that patients that present where you know their neck condition um really doesn't seem to fit a mechanical pattern so they might have some severe pain or constant pain or you know um you know that, that that doesn't seem to be related necessarily to movements or positions in the neck so there's something not quite right um and you know particularly you know, when people are might have a history of malignancy and things like that and you know they're people that really you, you need to have the chat with the general practitioner about you know the need for a scan perhaps just to check that there's nothing sinister happening uh, um, behind the scenes so there's, I guess, three examples where scans might be relevant. There's probably many, there's many more, mm. um, but certainly when indicated, yeah. There's... That's right, when indicated, and certainly that's sort of a bit of a, a you know, applicable across the health field these days, isn't it? Because there has been a, an excessive use of, of scanning and, and often found that it can be more uh, to the detriment rather than the benefit. So it is only in certain circumstances. Um, another question, just to be, uh, to, someone's asking about uh, a little bit about hypermobility syndrome and how this can affect the neck or cause neck pain um, and what might be the most effective treatment options. Well, I guess if you, and people can have hypermobility for different reasons. Some people just are very mobile. Some people might have, you know, connective tissue disorders and things that might make them hypermobile. Some people have absent ligaments in the upper cervical spine and things like that. There are different conditions where, and and you know one of the, I guess the the things is, uh, with those patients is is to very progressively, gently and progressively improve their muscle function. Mm -hmm. um, you know their coordination of their muscles, the movement control. It's it's not just about improving strength and endurance and power and all that they're important features to build up to, but you have to have a, a good underlying control of your neck and muscles and, and um, you know, as a good basis to work, you know, to build up into those higher levels of performance of your neck muscles. So for people that, that you know, progressive exercise supervised by someone who's sort of, you know, tuned into how to train neck muscle would be a key thing I would have thought. Mm. And um, uh, Sean, is there any um, correlation between neck pain and the number of pillows used when sleeping? Um, yeah, and look, and this is, uh, and I forgot to say it actually. Um, yeah, one of the things, yeah, you, you know, if, and and again, it's it's about understanding what when the person's neck pain is affected. So you know, if you had a patient that uh, you said to them, "Look, do you have any problems um, sleeping at night?" Do you have any problems going to sleep? Do you have any? Do you wake up with any neck pain? Do you, you know, are you, is your neck pretty good in the mornings? If they, if they said, no, nah, no problems at all, go to sleep, fall asleep straight away, sleep all night, you know, um, wake up feeling pretty good. It's what 
I do during the day when I start lifting things and that. Yeah, for those people, pillows, particularly if they're happy with their pillows, that mightn't be such a, a problem. But if it was someone who said, "Yeah, you know what? I, I just don't seem to be able to get in a comfortable position when I go to bed. I tried smaller pillows, bigger pillows, ones with the roll in them. You know, uh, um, and sometimes I wake up and I have to just move my neck and get into a better position. I always wake up feeling a bit worse. And when I went to bed, yeah, you know, that would be when you'd go, "Gee, well, maybe a pill, the taking a bit of focus." and trolling different pillows or heights or softnesses or whatever might be a key thing for that person so again it's picking it's picking the person uh where it might be the most appropriate not because not everyone will need that mm -hmm. okay um there is a question about some general neck strengthening exercises but i suppose it's a bit hard for you to sort of do that in the context yeah. of the webinar this evening um but when you talked uh, sean about sort of an appropriate or suitably qualified health professional are you mainly referring to a physio as the first port of call for someone experiencing neck pain oh look obviously i'm a physio i'm going to be biased <laughs> towards physio but you know uh, there's lots of people who who manage neck conditions and you know osteopaths chiropractors exercise physiologists occupational therapists there there's lots of people who you know i guess you've got to irrespective of who you see you've got to be happy with what they're doing uh and um that you, they, you feel they've asked all the appropriate questions and they've considered all and and that you're benefiting from treatment and is the you know that you're actually getting some benefit um yeah, so I suppose if someone's looking specifically for some neck strengthening exercises, probably a, a, a physio exercise physiologist would be more appropriate um, than, uh, say, an osteopath or, or, well, I suppose any of them really, as you as you mean, occupational yeah. therapists. I can only really speak for physios. Yeah, certainly, certainly we put a big emphasis on it in physiotherapy. That's for sure. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you just give a bit more insight about cer cervical dizziness? Yeah. And so, well, um, as I said, like dizziness is can be from a lot of different causes. And, you know, um, a lot, that's why if you do have dizziness um, as, you know, presenting with your neck disorder, uh, you really do need it to be looked at to make sure it's not something that needs medication or assessment of a vestibular or treatment of the vestibular system. But, you know, some people with neck conditions, who have you know maybe some um, impairments of their neck muscles or strain of their neck joints um, can, because of that uh, high density of receptors in the neck that you know tell the brain where the head is and wh whether you're upright and that information is continuously monitored against the information from your vision and from your vestibular system. If that's altered in some people with neck disorders, you know they can present with dizziness and unsteadiness and some lack of balance and. So it, it and it's that type of dizziness the, that stems from the neck that is best treated uh, by treatment of the neck. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that be a specific exercise the neck or some of the sensory motor exercises, uh, coordination exercises. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, um, yeah, Associate Professor Julia Trelevin, uh, that I work with at University of Queensland, is is someone that would be really quite good to 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 talk specifically to that that's very much her area of expertise is cervical dizziness yeah. mm -hmm. and um uh, you did mention about manual therapy and and someone specifically uh, mentioned remedial massage therapy um so that would be one of uh, you know and and also remedial massage therapists could be one of the people that a person might see um, to gain some ideas, you know, or some relief with their neck pain and so on. So you you would also sort of put them in the group of of uh, possible health professionals, yep. uh, Sean. Yep. And again, so long as it's being helpful, mm. so long as the person's gaining benefit from it. Yeah. I'll say this though, and it's the same with manual therapy, uh, is that while manual therapy and and remedial massage and that may help reduce, yeah. Know, painful muscle spasm and might help the person move a bit better if the person has underlying deficits in their neck muscles you know whether it be a lack of co coordination or you know um, deficits in their strength or endurance or maybe, then those sort of treatments will probably not well won't address that that needs to be specifically addressed with exercise so um, you know while manual therapy and remedial massage might be helpful and you know, 
it won't address some impairments that might need you know, other interventions like, of course, exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, a question about, um, you know, what can you do for pain relief when a degenerative condition is diagnosed, probably via a scan? Um, so, I mean, you would still sort of recommend that sort of multimodal approach, yeah. Sean? Do you know, uh, and you, you'll see patients and scans of, of all different severities of degenerative mm. you know, conditions. And, and the thing is, is that we know is that there's not a good correlation between mm. the severity of degeneration and the severity of symptoms. And you'll have some people with a lot of pain and their, their image um, will be quite clean looking. Mm. And then you'll have some patients who don't have a lot of pain and they'll have quite severe degeneration. So while it is you know, a feature and a problem and you know, not to be ignored, it, it doesn't necessarily correlate with the, the level of symptoms and we we treat them the same mm. in that we you know, we apply appropriate education and advice about how they might self-manage their naked the you know progressive exercise within their capabilities some gentle hands-on therapies but mm. if that's helpful you know it's the same management mm. um and 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 they can do really well mm. yeah Yep, yep, no, so that, and you certainly outlined that. Well, listen, we're just one minute away from 8 p.m. in um, uh, Australian Eastern Daylight Time. You're in Queensland, so I know it's nearly uh, 7, 7 p.m. there. Um, so, look, Sean, thank you, for, especially for those sort of comprehensive responses to the various questions that, are, that have come through this evening and so on. So, look, thank you very much for uh, your presentation tonight and your generosity and sharing of your expertise. So that's been very helpful. Um, and I'll just remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and will be available on the, our Musculoskeletal Australia website in the next week. You'll also be, it'll also be sent out to anyone who's registered for tonight's webinar. So you can share it around, it's freely available for viewing and so on. There's a lot of information within the webinar tonight. So you can re-watch the webinar recording as many times as you like, um, just so you can make sure you sort of got all the information and, and understood it. Uh, you can always contact our um, helpline if you also need some for further clarification and the number is on our website. So look, thank you everyone for joining this evening. Please respond to the exit survey, which will come on your screen shortly. And Sean, thanks very much again. And hopefully we'll see you all at our next, uh, well, the Coadlo lecture on uh, Tuesday, the 31st of October, which will be uh, Liam Mannix talking about his book called Back Up. So look, on that note, I'll say bid everyone a very good, good night. Thank Thanks, you. Sean. Thank you. Thank you.